We are live, or I think we are. There we go. Hello, everyone. Hello, hello. Why am I seeing an ad? Skip. That, that's an inauspicious start to see an ad. I know. <laughs> Hello, everybody. We'll get set up here. <laughs> Hello. So we're just getting, I'm, John's ready. I'm just getting the, the set up where I can see Zoom and my husband, Dr. John, and chat at the same time. So just give us a second. Dr. John, we already have 270 people watching, so. Welcome, welcome. I thought you said Chad instead of chat. Chat, oh. You said, I thought uh, you said Chad, that we could see Chad. I'm like, are we getting Chad from- No, Mike? let's start yeah. drinking early. No, we're not gonna see Chad tonight. Okay. All right, <laughs> I, I just wanted clarification on that. That's, that's what I thought for a minute. Although once Chad did show up in chat when we were showing Sean Little Bear's interview, Chad Daybell showed up in chat and said that he had come through a portal in the prison to see everyone. So um, okay. we, we blocked that troll, but it, it was, you know, <laughs> if that happens, welcome, Chad, welcome. Cause we're about to start talking about your offspring a little bit and the interview they did. Uh, you know, they, they've shared publicly for the first time. It's been, how many years has it been since December, 2019, everybody's been wanting to hear them talk. And they finally, all five of them sat down together, kind of all five of them, kind of. Right. It was more like two, maybe two and a half. <laughs> yeah. Oh, here's Kay. So my, my chat was stuck. So I kept waiting for everyone to talk. And now I see it's going fast. Hello, Kay. Kay Woodcox here with us. Hello, Liz. Hello, everyone. I'm seeing a lot of names that I'm not going to mention because I can't mention everyone, but I see all of you. Hello, hello. So John and I, Dr. John and I watched the interview separately. John watched it live the night it aired. I took one for the team and stayed home with our son. And then the next morning I woke up while John was working and I watched it. And then uh, for our Patreon supporters, we talked about it for the first time ever together at lunch. And we've talked about it a lot more since, I think, even after that episode. Do you have a place you want to start or do you want me to start with a question for you? Um. Uh, let me just, let me make an observation to start with. So, you know, in, in family therapy, there's this old tidbit of wisdom that when a family comes into your office, you pay attention to the seating arrangement. So for example, I remember a couple of years ago, I had a family come, on, come into my office and the issue was that the daughter was acting out a little bit. She was a young adolescent and, um, the whole family was pretty much blaming her except for the mother. So the family comes into my office and uh, I had a, kind of a big couch and a smaller couch and a couple of chairs in the office at the time. And um, the mother came in and, and immediately went to the smaller couch and sat next to the daughter that was acting out. And the father came in with the son who was a little bit older, a couple of years older than the daughter and sat next to the son. So that was kind of an interesting arrangement to see right away, right? Like just based upon the seating, the way the family came into the office and sat down, I was already making certain assumptions um, that the mother was, was aligned or close to the daughter and per perhaps protecting the daughter and that the father and the son were very close and aligned and, and, perhaps uh, forming a dyad or a coalition as family therapists sometimes call it, uh, kind of against the mother-daughter dyad. Um, and it, it turns out, of course, that that was, that was pretty much what was going on right from the start. So before they even said a word, you know, I was getting a lot of information about the family and the way they sat together and 
what those alliances meant and what they meant for the family and for the system. And, um, and if the first thing I noticed about the Daybell kids was the way they sat. So Emma was in the most prominent chair on the bottom and then Garth was sitting next to her on the bottom tier. And then there was a top tier with the three other kids, uh, Seth, Mark, and Leah, who's the, who's the other daughter? I'm sorry. Leah. Leah, Leah. Leah so, Seth, and Mark are in the back. So I, I made an assumption right away that, that, that Emma was probably going to be in, in control of the interview and that Garth would pl probably play a prominent role. And um, that was before. That was just based on the seating arrangement. And, and it, of course, it turns out that that was, that was true. So this is, this is kind of a little tidbit of family therapy wisdom that's talked about by a family therapist named Carl Whitaker and Virginia Satir and a lot of other family therapists, you know, back in the sixties when, when they started all this. And so that was the first thing that stood out to me was that I was making a lot of assumptions. Maybe they were wrong. I didn't know, but about this family based on the seating arrangement. And um, uh, I was kind of seeing Emma as playing a prominent role and that turned out to be true. Um, and I thought that was interesting. Yeah, well, let me say this too for those um, that are questioning. Yes, the, the show would have helped decide, but being a journalist, setting people up for interviews, the show is also going to look and see who's going to talk the most. So either way you look at it, the show's going to realize Garth and Emma want to talk the most. We're going to put them up here. That's how the show would also uh, right. decide who goes where in the interview. Right. The show kind of, uh, I think the show kind of developed the natural hierarchy of the, of the children anyway. Right. But um, yeah, that's true. The show was going to, they wanted the most prominent people in front, but if they had just walked into that room without any direction, my guess is that's how they would have sat. Yeah. And I asked you this for our Patreon episode, but the same thing I try to imagine, I have five siblings, so there's six of us total. If we had all asked to do an interview um as a show of support from one of our parents i i don't know i don't see all six of us doing that together i thought that was interesting as well that you know emma could have said you know what i'm ready to speak i'm going to go talk or garth why don't you and i talk but you know because clearly it was i think kind of the emma show you know she's the only one that went out to the property right. but yeah. they were able to get all five in there uh what do you think that meant well, you know, so one of the things we talked about in our in our Patreon discussion was the difference between a Nimesh family and a disengaged family. So um, being a Nimesh is, is a function of boundaries. So there, there's different types of family boundaries. There's, let's call them external boundaries. External boundaries would be the boundary that the family has uh, between the family and the outside world. So a family that has really rigid boundaries is basically uh, preventing any information from coming into the family system, right? They're, they're trying to keep things, um, information that might conflict with family um, beliefs or values, they're trying to keep that out of the family. So um, that's one type of boundaries, but they're also, uh, there's also internal boundaries, which has to deal with issues around closeness and distance. And so, Amesh families are overly close. Uh, a lot of times, like super Amesh families, um, will really struggle to like separate one from the other. That their identities kind of overlap. That they're really immersed in the family culture and the values of the family. That they really don't know what distinguishes their values or their beliefs from other people in the family. So to be Amesh is to be really, really close. It's to have really poor boundaries. <laughs> And um, um, and it's and in some ways it, it's a real struggle to to figure out one's identity in these types of families because there's such loyalty and there's such closeness that these the family members really struggle to figure out who's who and how they're different and you know it I think this is definitely more of an enmeshed family. Um, you mentioning that you know you couldn't get all your siblings in a room, that would be the other side of that equation. That would be more disengaged. What are you saying? No. So, <laughs> making an observation. So uh, always making observations. <laughs> disengaged families tend to be uh, distant, 
they tend each family member tends to be really independent. There's less of an emotional connection among family members. Um, you know, at the at the extreme end of the spectrum, disengaged families kind of do their own thing. They don't really care about the other members. Um, it's going to be harder to get you know five siblings in a room together if they're disengaged because they really just they're indifferent to the family. They're not as loyal. Um, and again, I'm, I'm talking about the two extremes. So, you know, the, the healthiest place is in the middle, like most things, it's the middle ground between enmeshed and disengaged, right? So I, I always think of one of my favorite metaphors in psychology is, um, it's a Freudian metaphor. And, and Freud on his desk had a porcupine. And a lot of people, when they see a picture of like old pictures of Freud in his desk, they'd say, why did he, what's up with that? Why would, yeah, why, would Freud, that? why would Freud have a porcupine? And the reason is because Freud saw that as a perfect metaphor for the human condition. And what he meant by that was that porcupines, when porcupines try to become intimate, if they get too close to one another, they they hurt each other with their quills. Their quills stick into each other and they actually physically become hurt by the quills, right? And if they're too distant, if they're far apart from each other, obviously there's no chance at intimacy, they're disengaged, right? So the, the quills kind of going into or poking each other, that would be a metaphor for enmeshment and the porcupines being completely separate and distant where they can barely see each other, that would be disengaged. So, but the point is that Porcupines for Freud had to figure out an optimal level of engagement, an optimal level of intimacy where the quills were close enough that they were intimate, but not too distant so they weren't, right? So Freud actually saw the porcupine as like this perfect metaphor for human beings that, you know, if we get too close to one another, we can hurt each other. And if we're too far apart, we don't take any risk and there's no chance of intimacy. So um, families are like that too. That if families are too close, they really um, start, they start becoming divorced from reality. That when yeah. families get really, really close, they start developing the same mental maps of the world. And they become, they become more and more um, shut off from the outside world. And when that happens, they become what I would call family centric. That is that they, they become their own entity. And they, they, they close off ranks from the outside world because, for example, let's, let's talk about the Daybell's belief. Let's talk about Chad's belief in, in portals and zombies. Let's say, let's say the kids knew about that and they were going to school, right? And one of the kids said, hey, you know, my dad thinks that there's a bunch of zombies. And maybe another kid would say, um, well, yeah, you know, I saw some zombies in the show, The Walking Dead, or I saw some zombies in a Marvel movie or whatever. And, the, and the, the Daybell child is taught to see zombies as being literal, you know, literal manifestations of people that, that, that zombies really exist. Whereas the other child will say, no, you know, that's kind of fiction. So the child comes home and says, dad, you know, little Joey said that zombies aren't real. They're just in Marvel movies. And Chad Daybell says, uh, no, you know, you know, he's wrong. Ignore that. Like, Zombies really exist and you need to learn that now, otherwise you're gonna really get hurt, right? So what happens in that family is the child starts developing this belief in zombies, which don't really fit the real world. And as like the, this kid Joey that confronted one of the Daybells hypothetically is trying to point out, right? And so what happens is the child is either going to question his father or the child is going to believe his father in this case. Right. And so right. families that are enmeshed, almost always the father is going to win. And we saw that in this interview. We saw yes. this constant, you know, I trust my dad. My dad is, can't be wrong. Right. And that that's another part of families. Families have rules. They always all families have these unwritten rules. So like in the Daybell family, I think a major unwritten rule would be something like never challenge your father. Right. You like, think probably. <laughs> you yeah. Think Never challenge your dad because he's always right. So yeah, I'm sure. So what, what happens in families over time, it, you know, when you when you get these extreme beliefs or beliefs that don't match the world, is that the family will close ranks because the family doesn't want the outside world to challenge them, right? So this is how you can develop a family of extremists or at least a family that 
you know, has these kind of bizarre beliefs that, that adheres to them in spite of outside challenges, like a reporter sitting in the room with you and asking questions, um, and how they can stay loyal to their father. Thank you. Thank you uh, to Dal Pace, Karen Michelle just now, Zelda Zelda, and Holly W. Uh, Karen um, Michelle asked, Lauren, I'm seeing this question discussed a lot in the chat from a journalist perspective. Do you know if the family got paid to do the interview? No, absolutely not. 48 hours would not pay to do an interview with the Daybell children. News stations and news programs do not pay for interviews. So that no, they would not have been paid. I also, I wanna bring up something else I saw Carrie Michelle say in chat. Uh, she said that if anybody wants to have a bolded question to ask, um, she'll pay some money to ask somebody. So thank you for that offer. So whoever is interested in that, uh, reach out to Karen. Michelle, and um, you kind of just answered it, John. Um, someone actually asked um, if an enmeshed family is bad, and then you continued and kind of explained where it gets really unhealthy. Yes, being too close to enmeshed without boundaries is bad. Yeah, it, you know, it, it's a tricky question. I, I don't think I'd use the term bad. I think, I think the goal of a healthy family is to produce healthy kids. And um, you know, like it or not, um, healthy kids have more realistic mental maps of the world, right? So the, the reality is that the parents that have kind of more realistic perceptions of the world, in other words, they probably don't believe that zombies and portals are real, you know, parents that have a better grasp of reality are going to generally have kids that have a, you know, a, a more accurate mental map. Yes. So, um, one of the ways I sometimes think of that is, um, you know, th the question I always ask is, do you, do you let the world change you or do you try to change the world first, right? Like hmm. healthy people let the world act on them. They let the world give them information and then they learn from that information. Unhealthy people, and this probably includes every politician that ever lived, unhealthy people, <laughs> Uh, maybe not every politician, but most of them. Um, politicians, their job is to change the world so that they don't have to look at themselves, right? Their job is to enact policy changes or whatever that politicians do. Um, but the reason politicians get into that is because they probably have a lot of underlying issues that they're not willing to consider or look at, and they would rather change other people than change themselves. So <clears throat> um, Healthy people let the world act on them. They don't act on the world to try to get it to fit their beliefs. Right. Okay. Thank you. That's a good explanation. Someone said Freud should have had a Venus flytrap. Leanne said that <laughs> on his desk. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying, Instead of a about, I'm trying to think about how Venus flytraps do intimacy. But yeah, that's, <laughs> a, that's an interesting uh, metaphor. I like it. Thank you. I also, I just, thank you so much for the, for the wonderful donations coming in. Thank you so much to Micah for your donation. I also want to thank, I forgot to at the beginning of this and, and babe, 920 people watching you. I, awesome. I, you know, yeah. So thank you, thank you everyone thank you for joining us. us. Thanks thank for you. Us. Thank you. Um, uh, one thing. Oh, and, and then I just lost what I was going to say. Liz, thank you so much for your donation. Oh, our mods tonight. Liz, thank you for your kindness. You are amazing too. Colette, Lee, um, and Julie are here today being mods. There might be some others that join us later or some that I missed. I'm sorry the the chat is going really fast for me. Uh, but they take this time and do this for us. And it's so wonderful. And I want to congratulate our... Uh, moderator Julie Holden. She won a cooking contest, a Pillsbury contest for one of her desserts. So um, I was hoping that she could be my neighbor so I could try it. I can't, but we're all very grateful for everything she does <laughs> beyond uh, deep diving into research. She's amazing. So anyway, thank you to our mods tonight. A lot of them are from True Crime Underground, Lori Daybell Cult Mom. That is a Facebook group and they can share the link there. There are some very interesting conversations and discussions that go on in that group. And I see some people from other groups too. Feel free to leave any group name anyone wants to. I see 
um, uh, a good friend from Reddit as well. So thank you everyone for being here today. Um, so I let's talk about something. Thank you, thank you, Marcella. Thank you for your donation. Such generosity, John. And I think I have a feeling it's because of you and you're here. So uh, <laughs> thank you, guys. <laughs> thank you Kathleen. Oh, and, and Larry Woodcock is here too, Kay says. Hello, Larry. Hey, Larry. I told, I talked hey, to Kay earlier today. I, I have to tell a story and we will get back to the meet. But I was talking to Kay earlier today and then I left and I went and picked up my son Banks and I was a little bit late and I told him, I said, I'm sorry, I was talking to Kay and Papa. And, they, and he said, did they say I was so cute? And I said, <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's what they said because they, they know that they are, you guys are Banks fans. So he, he loves you too. And he knows that he, he has a remote dinosaur for his birthday from them. And so anyways, uh, thank you, Kay and Papa. Thank you, Stephanie, for your donation. Um, let's talk about something we did not talk on Patreon. And that is the talk about, so the, let's go big picture and then let's go small. The big picture is there didn't seem to be a lot of emotion from the children shown, a flat affect, would you say? Um, and then the small picture, one specific thing I'd like to talk about is when Emma Daybell was outside and it definitely seemed like she was pretending to cry, I'm gonna be honest. Like everyone I talked to really, yeah. I don't know one person and if there is a person out there that believes that she was likely crying, um, let us know. But I haven't talked to one person who actually believes that she was truly crying, but that she was pretending to cry. Yeah. We, uh, we just we, got a very generous donation from Detective's Daughter, $50. Larry K. and Kresha, love and prayers from Nampa, Idaho. Thank you, Dr. John, for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, you know, it, it's funny because you and I watched it separately and then we talked about it later and you said, what did you, what did you think about the part when um, Emma cried? And I said, um, what part are you talking about? <laughs> so like, I, I didn't even see that as crying when I first saw it. I, I mean, I had to go back and, and watch it again because it was, it was so shallow and it was so inauthentic that my first, my first view of it was that this is, it's not crying. Like she's, but, but yeah, I could see how a lot of people would think she was faking it, you know, that the, it, it, it just, it didn't have any depth. Yeah, yeah. And it seemed like it was manufactured. Mm -hmm. um, so, but let, let, let's, let's, let me back up and go back to your, your bigger the big question. picture. Yeah, let's yeah. talk bigger picture first. Um, so, you know, this gets into, um, this gets into the issue of healthy families. And I think, um, we talk about families a lot in our podcast and we're going to always talk about families because we think families are like the, the foundation for mental health, right? Families are where we, we learn about the world. They're where we spend our most time. We grow up in our family. Like the family culture to me is by far the most critical component of developing healthy human beings. So you always say that that's true. We're, all, John yeah, always we're, always, says that. we're always going to talk about families because if you want to create criminals, then then the best way to do it is to, to develop a toxic family environment. So, um, so our goal, one of our goals in this podcast and YouTube channel eventually, or, you know, is, is to help, to help people look at their families. And so we can create healthier families. Were you going to say something? Yeah, well, no, I'm just, I'm quickly, um, hiding, I'm hiding Chad Daybell from our channel. Chad Daybell did come back. Okay. So um, thank you, Chad, and goodbye. Thank you, Eli Gray, for your donation. Um, so, so I'm sorry. Yeah, I probably interrupted your thought process. I'm sorry, babe. Yeah, um, so, well, so I was just saying that, you know, I was just talking about the importance of families and healthy families. And I think most of us intuit that, but that's supported by research. And um, it's supported by, you know, my personal experience of doing hundreds of evaluations. And I don't, I don't think, I think I've done, I don't know the numbers now, over 500 criminal evaluations. And I, the number of healthy families I've had right now has been zero. So 
Um, so let's get into that question. What makes so one of the things that that makes that's a part of a healthy family is open communication. So healthy right. families are more open. They're honest. They're direct. Uh, they don't, you know, they they're and they're better with emotions. So when I say open communication, I'm not just talking about, you know, like when our little guy comes home, we say, "How was school? What did you do? Who did you play with?" I'm not just talking about uh, content. I'm also talking about how families deal with emotion. So, so not just what they're talking about, but um, how they're talking about it. You know, and and so healthy families uh, do better with emotions. They they don't see em any emotions as taboo. Um, they don't have any problems talking about emotions or bringing up emotions or helping their kids deal with emotions. I've talked about Gottman's work on emotion coaching, you know, healthy families, ultimately the healthiest families. And there's not a lot of those, but what, what are called the optimal families. These are like the Olympi Olympic gold medal families. Um, there aren't a lot of them, right? John talks yeah. of in a podcast episode, how you just have to be a good enough parent. So, so nobody here, uh, feel bad that you're you might not be an optimal parent or family but go ahead tell us about the gold medal families <laughs> the gold medal families do a lot of emotion coaching so not only are they not afraid to talk about emotion but they're actually uh, encouraging their kids to deal with emotions and they're encouraging their kids to identify emotion and um, they're exceptional with that so um, why is that important because think about for example uh, a child who has no, so, you know, I've dealt with criminals who have no capacity to be angry. So when you think about that for a moment, right, like you murder someone and you have no ability to express anger, right? So right. Part, of What's the, up with part, that? Of the crime, part of the aggression is because they can't deal with the emotion of anger, right? So huh. these are kind of the classic cases of somebody who will bottle something up for years and years and years, and then they snap. Um, and then they'll tell me, you know, they'll tell me during the evaluation that, you know, my father, my father did not allow us to be angry. My father did not allow anger in the family. Every time we became angry, he would, he would chastise us or he would, he would spank us. Right. And so anger became taboo. Um, and, you know, the, the, I understand how too much anger can be upsetting in a family, but on the other hand, no anger is a problem too, because, um, as you and I know, Lauren, you know, sometimes Banks just, he has a lot of energy and he <laughs> wants to just be, he wants to be a little aggressive and get it out. And he wants to be for, he's not doing it in, a, in any destructive manner. He's just, he's just being for and trying to get it out. Um, you know, and, and we know from, from having talked to, to Larry and Kay that, that JJ had a lot of energy too. You know, and I'm sure JJ had some anger and, and that's fine. Like, you know, they understood that that was just a part of having a child and um, that's what children do. So, you know, so the, this case I'm talking about where the guy killed someone, you know, he said, yeah, we just, we had no anger. So he said, but that didn't mean that I didn't feel anger. I felt lots of anger. I just didn't know what to do with it. Yes. Right? So, so healthy families, they are open about communication in many ways. So in terms of learning, in terms of the, the topics they're discussing over dinner, in terms of emotions, in terms of pretty much everything. Um, and that's not to say that they're allowing everything to be discussed because they're not, there's limits. Um, but for the most part, really healthy families are, are very open in terms of communication and learning. Yeah, yeah. Um, I also want to state, uh, Kelsey Mariel made a great point. She said that people can develop over ch time, change is possible. And then she relayed a story about how she grew up in a family where emotion wasn't allowed, but they've all married healthy people and developed. So yeah, that's I'll awesome. share that too. That's awesome. Yeah. And let me, let me reiterate that point too, because there's, there's some really interesting research about, um, uh, by George Valiant, who it, it's about um, a group of men in this case. So unfortunately, it wasn't, it didn't include men and women, but um, it was, it was begun in the 50s. So um, 
at that time, that's the best sample they could find. But they followed these men for now, I think, 70 years. And um, they, the men that grew up in the least healthy families in, in the way I'm discussing, a good chunk of them um, ended up becoming much healthier. And the, the reason that's true is because um, as they went out into the world and, and interacted with larger systems like schools or educational institutions or work, organizations that, you know, that they had to, to be a part of, um, they learned from those organizations. And so in many ways that even if we grow up in really dysfunctional families, if we're open to information and we interact with reasonably healthy organizations uh, and we try to learn from that, we can change and we do change. Thank you. So the Daybell children, we sense they're enmeshed speculating. We're definitely we, a match. Oh, okay. Definitely. <laughs> We're speculating <laughs> straight from the dot. We're speculating that uh, emotion is not talked about or expressed in the family a lot. But real I emotion. Think, I think, I think emotion was, so I, I think the way to see the Daybell family is to see Chad Daybell as, as the, the person in charge of the family. And as, as the person in charge of the family, he controls the information coming in and out he controls, uh, believe it or not, he's controlling what emotions are allowed. He's controlling the topics of conversation, um, right? I mean, it, it, and I'm, I don't mean that he's like, I don't mean that in a super extreme way. I mean, it probably in more of a, a subtle way. Right. right? So maybe a child will get angry and he'll say, no, 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 we don't do that here. You know, he may not chastise them, but he's, he's sending a message about certain things that are acceptable. Yeah. Um, so I, I think in the Daybell family, you know, you have a group of kids that kind of grew up with a father that um, either directly or indirectly was controlling information and controlling affect. And you see the, the results of that. You see a bunch of kids that are, for the most part, fairly passive. Um, they're pretty much um, they're, they're loyal, obviously. I mean, as far as we can tell, some of them really didn't talk, but the sign of a, a a matched family is that they're they're really super loyal. So, you know, there's all this information that their dad may have committed this crime and they're willing to totally disregard it, right? So their loyalty is, is taking a priority over, over the reality of the situation. Yeah. Um, big thank you to Susie McFarlane and Lynn G. Bountiful for their donations. We have received so many generous donations tonight and I I have a feeling that's uh, because of uh, my husband here. Someone asked if you were if you uh, were my spouse. Yes, yes, he is, and we are actually at the same house right now, but <laughs> just in separate rooms. <laughs> we figure that's easier than like squishing together in one camera. We have a question from Kay Woodcock. I'm going to um, ask. I have a lot of great questions, and I have some questions from our Patreon members too that I have yeah. here. So everyone, yeah, I have a lot of questions. We had a great dialogue with some of our Patreon people. That was so. Thank you for that. We appreciate that. Yeah, we're reading them all, Patreon supporters, and and so thank you for that. And and babe, also over a thousand people have been watching for quite a while now. So awesome. thank you. Thank you yeah. for joining us. Yeah. So um, Kay asks Dr. John, their mom's death. Wasn't it strange that they didn't challenge their dad about their mom dying since he marries? She put three weeks later. I'd like to clarify that was, it was not three weeks. It was not yet three weeks. It was like two weeks and some days. And when Emma said, if Chad, and then in addition to that, when Emma said, if Chad, if, if dad was in a cult, wouldn't we be the first to know? <laughs> Sorry, the thing that always makes right. me giggle. Yeah. Those are two separate things. Let's start with the, the Tammy, um, well, why they didn't challenge the mother. I want to start with the cult thing because okay. the, the people in a cult, Actually, the people that are most immersed in a cult are actually the last to know. So, I mean, like her comment actually shows that there's kind of cult-like behavior in this family in the sense that they place unconditional trust in their father. So if their father says, I didn't kill her, they're not looking at the evidence. That's cult-like, right? Like cult-like behavior is when you put absolute trust and faith in the cult leader and you don't question things that that interfere or challenge that, that leader's cult leader's beliefs, right? So ironically, by her saying that, she's actually kind of showing that this family is cult-like. 
<laughs> I mean, I watched it alone without John. And honestly, when they said that, I giggled a little because nobody joins a cult saying, I want to join a cult. They join a cult not knowing right. they're in a cult. It takes you, it takes getting somebody out of a cult to even realize, oh, I think I was in a cult. Nobody thinks they're in a cult when they're in a cult. And they, they also, they kind of denied not knowing their dad's extreme beliefs, where we know that Seth has voiced some of his dad's books and Emma has voiced Julie Rose books. And they definitely know, I mean, I'm not saying they know about all these finite details at the very end, but they definitely know a lot about his extreme beliefs. They've been extreme yeah. for a while. The right. prepper group in Idaho, in general, the preparing a people group, the avow group, these are all kind of extreme religious beliefs in general. Yeah, and they, they knew his books. I mean, yeah, this would be a long discussion, but I mean, it's clear that the children knew some of those extreme beliefs because they knew his books. Like in Chad's last book, he actually talks about uh, communicating with like this warrior army that consisted of Joseph Smith and that he was having like direct discussions with Joseph Smith. Like there's, there's some pretty, there's some pretty extreme stuff in some of these books. So they, they knew that, right? The, the, the issue is though, that they see those beliefs as being normal. Right. Like, like kind of what I talked about earlier, like when one of the kids would go to school and say, hey, my dad says they're zombies. You know, the other kids like, uh, yeah, uh, okay. You know, um, the, my point is that in a family like the Daybell family, where you have kind of these unusual beliefs, like let's zombies would be an extreme example of that, that gets normalized, right? So what you and I would see as extreme, they see as normal. Well, yeah, I mean, of course the, you know, of course we're all gonna get in the portal. Of course we're prepping for the right. end that's gonna happen. And of course Rexburg's that final place. And of course, Julie Rowe can, you know, hear these, angels and has visions and and of course my dad's veil is thin and he can see right of course it's just life it's normal is what one is accustomed to is what i always say how do we know what normal is you know right and so and also another point there is um you know healthy families healthy families tend to see the world a little more realistically um and when your father is is basically creating this fantasy world and sees that as more important than the world we're living in, right? Like, um, like for, you know, more important than like what your kid's gonna eat for lunch at school or whatever. You know, when you live in, when you create this fa fantasy world that's so divorced from reality, you know, you're gonna get a lot of distorted views of the world. Yes. Like what you think is normal is not gonna be normal. Right, right. So, yeah, wouldn't they be the first to know? No, they wouldn't. They would not be the first to know. Right, they'd be the last to know. They'll they would be the, be the last, last to know. They'd be the last to figure out that they were duped. <laughs> we have received so many generous donations really quickly. Thank you, Elizabeth, Mari Dithi, Karen Michelle, Meadowcrone. There are so many, and a lot of them are writing questions and comments that are very, very good. So I will try to get to them all because we're getting so many in at the same time. I have notes here and will work. And thank you, Elizabeth, for your compliment. Number number one couple on YouTube. So so kind. Thank you. Um, and, and quickly, let me get back to Kay's first part of that question too, really quickly, so we don't forget. But the yes, the the. the the question, the, I think part of the question is, um, you know, <laughs> why don't the kids want justice for their mother, right? Like if there's, if there's some suspicion that she was murdered, and obviously the state of Idaho thinks that there's plenty of evidence to support that conclusion, then wouldn't these kids have some like anger or animosity towards their father? Like where the, he murdered their mother. I mean, potentially, let me, let me qualify that because I don't want to get sued, but he, so he's charged, the Chad Beemel is currently charged with and presumed to have murdered their mother based on the evidence that the state has. So, right. so the, again, you know, but the, 
again, the reason is I think the 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 reason the kids don't aren't as interested in that is because Chad Daybell was the one who controlled the information and the communication and the emotions in that family, much more so than than Tammy. And we know from talking to people close to the Daybells that um, that in spite of the fact that Chad tended to be soft-spoken and maybe a little passive, we know that he ran that family without a doubt. We know that. Yes. Yes, we do know that. And, and what you just said is important too. You've suspected that Emma was closer to Chad than to Tammy too. Or you kind of mentioned it just we, there. We so I'll throw it out that. there. We talked about that the other day, but um, I, you know, that's, that could be opening a can of worms. I think, okay, sorry. I thought, okay. Um, um, I, I think there's evidence to suggest that, and this is, this would be, you know, we, I want to be careful with this. Um, I, we talked about this a little on Patreon because it's more of a private forum, but. Um, speculation. Sorry, babe. Just speculation. Briefly. Yeah. Um, I, I think there's some evidence to suggest that um, the Chad was very close to Emma and, um, you know, it, it, Emma mentioned that she was getting death threats. And I, I think one of the reasons she was getting death threats is because people see her as complicit in the murders. But let me say this, that, you know, there's, the state has no evidence of that. They haven't charged her, right? Like you have to presume that she didn't know much about the murder. I mean, based on what we know now, you have to assume that, right. that she didn't know much and that the state obviously doesn't think there's sufficient evidence. But I think the the death threats are probably coming from from people that are really enraged um, over the fact that she was very close to her father. And there's probably some presumption among those people that uh, she knows a lot more than she's revealing. Which is never an excuse for a death threat, but, but right. Yeah, that's... yeah, no, the, the, right, yeah, for sure. I mean, right, nobody, I mean, it, it's, it's all people that are doing that are, you know, they're out on a limb, they're speculating, they're not basing it on any evidence. So, but even if they, even if it was, it's the state's job to, to deal with that issue and not individuals. So. Mari DT said, um, and I, I'm sorry if I pronounce your name wrong, but she said, your username wrong. She said, speaking from my religion generation, um, we moms taught respect for dad, even when they were wrong. Just giving a personal perspective there. And I think that is common. And then when you take, you know, their conservative religion and their beliefs, um, I think that that was definitely something there. I think that Tammy let Chad take the role because that's also probably how she was raised to do it, you know? Right. I don't think that, and I don't think that necessarily means she believed everything he did. I just think she held the fort down kind of, if that makes sense, did what she needed to do to be married to Chad Daybell. And, you know, again, getting back to healthy families, in the healthiest families, the parental relationship is is key. It sets the tone for the family. Um, and in the healthiest families, you know, the parents are, they share power. You know, they, they it doesn't mean they're, they're exactly equal in terms of how they use that power, but uh, the parents, um, you know, they, they both have a role in raising the kids and they both exchange information and they don't withhold information from each other. And it's, it's more of a reciprocal relationship. So, you know, I certainly get the respect part, but did Tammy have a voice, right? That's right. the question. That in well, the healthiest he families, everyone has a voice, even the kids. The kids, you know, when there's tough decisions to be made, believe it or not, in the healthiest families, the kids are asked their opinion. They may not, the parents make the decisions in the end, but the children, it's more of a democracy. The kids have a say, and then the parents will say, well, you know, I respect your opinion, but we're going to do this. So, um, so, you know, there's a hierarchy, the parents are in charge, but uh, everyone has a voice. Our son definitely have a, a voice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's says too much. Well, right. Med Med Metacron asked, do you think Chad groomed the kids to prepare, prepare them not to challenge Tammy's death? And I, th I think, yes. I think he groomed a lot of people to not challenge Tammy's death by telling everybody that she was going to die, you know, for years, in my opinion. Um, and I'm sure that his children were no different, sort of like how they all said, oh, she was sick. She was sick. I think 
he, he, I don't know if groom is the right word. How would you explain that? I think, I think the way we've been talking about it, I think he was grooming these kids since they were born, right? But in the sense that he was creating a family culture that was very restrictive, that had some peculiar beliefs, um, that allowed these kids to have distorted map, mental maps of the world, right? Like in some ways, you know, in some ways these kids, if grooming is the term we're gonna use, in some way these kids were groomed since birth to, to deal with a situation like this or to, you know, to support their father. Right. In a situation like this. Another question um, in regards to that, you said there's something that's, it's not necessarily confirmation bias, but it's similar to that where the way people remember things or they form a memory that wasn't totally. Yeah, well, we, yeah. I, well there, there's, a, there's another cognitive bias or distortion called the hindsight bias. Hindsight so, bias, that was the that, word I was looking for. That's, that's the same thing as like Monday, you know, Monday morning quarterbacking, right? Like you, you know, you know, the outcome of the game and it's easy to go back and say, well, what if so-and-so did this? Or what if this person did that? Then, you know, we would have won. Right. But it's the same thing. Like, so they know what's happened. They know the outcome. So they're, they're now taking that outcome and distorting the information from the past to make their beliefs fit that outcome. Right, that's called hindsight bias. Any sports, right. any sports fan, if Larry's still there, any sports fan would know hindsight bias. What hindsight bias is, because our team, our team always wins on you know uh, the day after the game. Right, right. Um, we're getting a lot of great questions and a lot of wonderful donations. Thank you to Lacey. Thank you to sly scorpio um there, i'm gonna just say a bunch of the questions and then you okay. pick what to say because there is so much coming i and i still haven't read the rest of the questions and comments so i am sorry everyone this is kind of a first that i don't feel like i might be able to get to everything but we'll do our best lacy asked um this is actually a question i have written down that i want to ask uh, kind of so lacy asks Dr. John, do you think Chad's children will continue to keep their views on their father's guilt or that with new evidence, they will divide their views? And before you answer that, I wanna say that we have a, a something else um, on Patreon. Our Carly says, it almost seems like the younger two boys don't necessarily agree with Garth or Emma. Like, so some people are speculating that maybe there already is a divide and somebody else, Sue also kind of stated the same thing that Emma and Garth seem more in sync than say the other kids. So I'm throwing a lot out there. Will there be a divide one day? Is there already a divide one day? What do you think? Already a divide period. Yeah, I mean, this is speculation, but just looking at the interview, uh, you know, it looks to me like, I, I think maybe there's some confusion over, I think what's happening is Emma's taking the leadership role in the family. So Emma is now becoming Chad's voice. And she said that, she said, she said, my father needs a voice, right? And, and guess what? She's that voice. She's closest to her dad. Um, so I, I think I wouldn't confuse a division in the family with a change in leadership. I think Emma's stepping into that role and I think everyone else in the family's towing the line. I don't see, I think in an Amesh family like this, generally speaking, you're not gonna see those kinds of splits. Maybe if some of the younger kids are a little healthier, and maybe if the evidence becomes overwhelming that, you know, maybe they'll start questioning and there's more likely to split. But right now, the way I saw it, I saw Emma like exerting total control over this family, uh, including Garth. And um, Emma is kind of the spokesperson and she's, she's kind of getting the others to fall in line. So um, I think in, in a really a mesh family, it takes a lot for the family to split and to fracture against one another. So to me, this is just a case of Emma becomes Chad. Emma now controls the family, the information. And she said that she's like, she kind of said that what they were doing was, was kind of a PR thing, right? Like uh, my dad needs a voice. So here I am, you know, in front of millions of people giving him a voice. Yes. Thank you for sharing that. We just got a very generous $100 donation. 
babe, from Bridget Dunnington, Dunnington, which I have to say that name sounds like it's straight out of a Jane Austen book. <laughs> Bridget Dunnington. That's, that's a great name. I love it. It is. So grateful to both of you for your wholehearted investment in this case. Thank you for giving us all an intelligent forum to discuss and understand the complexities of this tragedy. Keep it going. We will, thank Bridget. You. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Bridget. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there was a question. Did the kids do this on their own volition or was this Chad requesting them to do it? Somebody asked. I, you know, I, I wish I knew. I think that's a great question because it actually speaks to some of our, our, our Patreon folks were asking us um, if we think that this shows a split between Chad and Lori. Um, and the answer to that is, I, you know, we don't, it, is, you know, the question is, is this going to become Chad's defense strategy? Right? Like, if this is going to be def Chad's defense strategy and, you know, it, we have no way of knowing that because um, I don't even know. Do you know if the kids are communicating with Chad? Because a lot of times in these cases, they won't let, since Garth is a potential witness, they won't let right. the kids communicate with them or prior, right? So it's a really um, good question, right? Because if, and maybe Kay or Larry might know, but if they are potential witnesses, it does make things a little bit more complicated. Typically, family members can speak to right. their family members behind bars but you know there's always that but but like garth is garth may be a witness so um i would like to know you know if there is communication between emma and chad and chad is telling her uh that he was framed and that that's their defense um you know then then that's interesting then that would indicate that that Chad is starting to turn against Lori. Um, right. Um, and so, and what was the, go back to the question again, really quickly there. Uh, well, um, so, well, I think you answered it. Um, there are a few questions. Can I, can I ask some others? Is that okay? I think you pretty much answered it. Do we know? Do we know if it was Chad that maybe asked for this interview, or did the children choose to do it on their own? With the question, yeah. So it depends on the level of communication between Emma and Chad, or the kids and Chad. Which, if, to my mind, I you know I I can't imagine that they're communicating if you know if some of them are going to be witnesses to Tammy's murder. But I you know if. If they're communicating, then I guess they're kind of telling us what their defense strategy might be, which I think is really fascinating in and of itself. Right. But, um, but uh, you know, so maybe, maybe Chad, maybe Chad did tell Emma, look, you know, I want you to go on the air and, and talk about this because this could help me because I want to change public perceptions um, about this case and about my situation. And, and I was frank. Right, like it could be, it certainly could be that, but I don't know. I don't know. Again, like the whole thing with him, John. I don't know if the if the DA is allowing uh, kids to communicate with Chad. I, I would personally, if I were the DA, I would, I would probably try to restrict that. But I don't know. Yeah, I know. I don't know. I don't know. It's it's interesting uh to question who did it it seems like they would be taking directions from their father but it also seems like maybe they decided together that it was time i guarantee you 48 hours didn't just start talking to them i'll tell you that <laughs> um you know i'm sure there's been communication and conversation for a very long time and when they were ready they were ready and they probably even set some guidelines and put some boundaries down for 48 hours, you know, whatever they decided. When people, when I interview people, when people trust me with their interviews, it's not uncommon for them to say, I'll do this, but I don't want to go here, 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 or here. And I'll respect that, you know? So um, let's talk about this story we've heard for the first time about Emma seeing Chad in the police car after he's arrested. So, so let me go back a little bit. Emma starts by saying Chad left the house while they, the police were searching the yard to go meet with his attorney. And she drove and found him handcuffed 
in a police car. A police told her that children, or, or excuse me, not children, that that human remains were found in the yard. And then Chad said, Emma, do you know why they arrested me? And she said, Dad, human re remains were found in the yard. That was a really whoa moment for me to hear this story because A, well, mostly I think it shows Chad as so manipulative. Yeah. Right. You know? I guess you'd have to ask, like, is it, is it possible that he didn't know that those bodies were buried there? I mean, I'd have to say the probability of that is close to zero, right? So that means he was acting. I think um, I think he was doing that for Emma, right? Like he obviously knew that yeah, those but... bodies. He obviously knew that those bodies were there. Okay. <laughs> Did you? No. Okay. So why don't you? Okay, I'm gonna come. Our son needs some help. Okay. So. Let's talk about this, continue on with this manipulation thing. And then I'm going to ask the next question that maybe you can delve into um, that we debate on. Oh, he might be taking care. Well, he might need help. Hold on. Let me just go tell the babysitter what he needs so that he's taken care of. So why don't, I just wanna talk about him being manipulative and what that means because John and I have a debate. We debate about how much how much did Chad Daybell believe his own beliefs? Did he believe every single bit of them? Or did it hit a point where he just loved the attention and was BSing it? Let's, is that an okay thing for you to start? And I'll just tell Emily what, um, Emily's our babysitter, what Banks needs. Uh, yeah, I can't see the questions, by the way, on my end. So Yeah, John can't see the questions. That's why I was throwing him one out. But so another question is, um, is uh, there were some things someone mentioned the Freud por porcupine thing you mentioned she, she sent a donation and said I'll try to find it um, where that came from I think he's okay by the way okay so we're okay okay I think you're right he needed, <laughs> he needed help so Let's talk. Can we talk about what I just brought up then? Because I so so let me frame it this way. Yesterday, as we talked to our Patreon supporters, we brought this up. And after realizing how Chad manipulated his children in quite a few ways, or so it seems, um, we started to speculate maybe he was manipulating some of the things at the end. John's always gone to you believe that he believes it totally, right? That's kind of been your, that John's kind of sticks to that where I, I go back and forth. And then, so with, with that, with that uh, manipulation, like that story with Emma, it just seems so sociopathic or psychopathic or antisocial. Uh, but I think, I think he was playing to his audience. He knows he can't lose Emma, right? He knows that if he's honest in that moment and says, oh, yeah, you know, I murdered the kids, like, he's, he, if he wants to have any chance of keeping the family together and maintaining the family loyalty that we've talked about, and again, this is such an enmeshed family, he's got to get Emma's loyalty and support, right? So I think he was totally playing to his audience. I think yeah. he was he he did that because he knew that Emma would believe him. And yeah. he need, he needs Emma on his side to perpetuate this myth that he was framed, if that's what he was thinking at the time. I, I don't think he was. He probably came up with that in the last month or two, but but I mean yeah. he, he he intuited that he had to have Emma as an ally, right? And if if um if he loses her then, then he's probably gonna lose Emma in terms of, you know, when he gets charged for Tammy's death, right? He's, 
he's going to lose Emma with with all of them, including you know Emma's mom, right, his wife. So, mm -hmm. um, so I think he he knew his audience. He knew how. And yeah, of course, that's manipulative. That's it's, it's I don't even right. I don't even know how to describe it. And again, like if we're talking about that, healthy people have a realistic perception of the world. I mean, talk about denial and talk about right. a distorted view of the world like oh yeah those weren't the kids bodies right right um i'll say this after so last night I'll, I'll give this little teaser last night john and i received something from a listener um an anonymous listener who said that they had forgotten that they happened to have this and they sent it <laughs> and it is the speech that Chad Daybell gave the, the day in St. Georgita that he is supposedly the same day he met Lori Daybell. So it was a 45 minute speech and John and I listened to that last night after speculating back and forth on what Chad may or may not believe. And after we listened to that 45 minute speech with Chad Daybell, you said, what did you say? Or should I tell you what you said? You said he believes it all. Yeah, I, I, this, the listening to that just confirms it. You know, they're just, it, and we, we hope to release that at some point. We're, we're not quite sure what to do with it yet, and we're not sure of the legalities of releasing it, but we're working on it. So, um, but the most interesting part of that was, um, the Chad got emotional. Chad got very emotional at certain parts of that. And uh, which is really atypical for Chad Daybell. He is not a very emotional guy. Um, and the reason he got emotional is because there were moments when he was talking about his visions. He got emotional because he believed deeply that his visions were accurate and that the world was gonna come to an end and that he was right. So that's a really, that's kind of an odd, that's a really peculiar reason to become like really emotional, right? But he did. A lot of people would, um, a lot of people I think would become more expressive, maybe, maybe a little louder, but they wouldn't cry. And so. Yeah, he cried. He was, he was crying, it was real. It was, cry. he, yeah, a little and more, a little bit more teasy. You cried when he started talking about Jason Mao. Yeah, right. But. I don't know a single other human being who would cry thinking about Jason Mao, but Chad did. So um, really quickly, I'm going to interrupt. I am getting texts from the babysitter. I do need to go help in this situation, okay. but let's give you another topic before I take off and I'll be right back. Is that okay, babe? He cannot see the chat. So I know it makes you a little nervous because you're yeah. talking to a screen and it <laughs> don't No, No, I hope you don't have any um, nerves or anything. It's only 3, 1,350 people watching right now. Um, okay. It's just I have no way of interacting with people. So. <laughs> so I'll give you something to talk on and I'll go help. And uh, and Larry wrote that tell Banks that Papa says hi and I'll tell him he 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 loves you guys. So Kay and Larry came and I will say Banks loves Larry Papa like he's somehow it's he's like a child whisper. He's unforgettable. It was so sweet. They played dinosaurs together. <laughs> um Karen Michelle asks this would be a good this would be a good question for the end but I'm going to ask it right now for you um and then so so for well I'll give you two things you can choose Karen says for what questions do you wish had been asked in the interview then somebody else wanted to talk about the emotional affair to that that Emma mentioned so you know what I'm going to throw out my question about the emotional affair which is she said it was socially inappropriate, but not, you know, he did nothing wrong. That made me angry. So she's okay with him having, whether it's sexual, emotional, whatever, let's just talk about that. Um, she's excusing her dad, you know, her, her mother's dead and it's her mother's fault. She's been asphyxiated. Maybe she just should have taken better care of her health, but you know, it might've been socially inappropriate, but um, I mean, she said that about the emotional affair, but he did nothing. I can't remember the exact quote, but I'd say it was a little bit more than socially inappropriate. And anyway, those are a few things. And what questions do you wish had been asked in the interview? Do any of those 
Um, and then and then Kay Woodcock wanted to know a little bit about some of the body language or the way the children sat. And those are three things. He's taken notes. I can see it. <laughs> and then um, and I and, and then I can't totally go back any further. And then and then some Patreon questions we had or thoughts we had. Do you feel like um, is this a possible setup for Chad flipping on Lori? Oh, and then I want people want to talk more about the flat delivery. Yes, we've talked about the lack of emotions, but um, is there depression and just what does it mean that Emma seemed to show no concern for Tylee and JJ being buried in their yard? Do any of those work for a second while I go help? It's it's a it's a restroom emergency. Yeah, it, it, yeah, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> it's just um, I wish like it would. I wish at this moment we could bring on like the voices of some of our listeners because I'm. I, I'm so used to interacting with someone, but well, you yeah. know what? We could do that too. We could do that. Um, by the way, there's a new thing that you can someone can maybe help us, but I have seen that there's a new system you can do where you can invite the questioners into uh the chat with us, and so we need to, yeah, we need to work awesome. on that. We need, we need to learn how to do that, that would be a lot of fun, yeah, and then um. And just also, we know that it wasn't an emotional affair too, because even Melanie Gibbs saw them being physical on the track. So right. there's a lot of denial. Um, just disregard for the mother's death and the, the, the tears. People just thought it was really uncomfortable that Emma even went there. They would have been more comfortable had she not attempted to show emotion. And... Um, yeah, what part of emotional was it when Chad slapped Lori's butt? <laughs> that was, that and was, that was the that was the storage. Yeah, the was, storage unit. The storage unit video. <laughs> right. It was very emotional. Right. Yeah. Or what part of emotional was it when they were on the track and he was making out with her? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know. Okay, someone said go help my kid. I, I do need to go, babe. Is there anything okay. you could talk about? i yeah. I feel like I'll, I need to help to, my yeah. husband and I need to help my child. So okay. Okay. You guys, he can't see the chat. Just know that I'll come yeah, in and I'll catch chat. up. So we he can't need, see will, it. This will give us incentive to um to bring some of our listeners on live for questions. That would be really cool if we could interact with you guys. But um so the um the what the the what questions to ask part I think that's really interesting. Um, you know, it as a forensic psychologist, uh, a big part of my job is to ask really difficult questions and questions that oft, often contradict the the felon's uh, story or their narrative. And so um, I think it was interesting yesterday that the reporter was trying to do that a little bit. Um, but I don't know if he went far enough with that. So I think, uh, I think I probably would have pressed him a little more and a little deeper about uh, contradictions. Um, you know, when when they heard the thud, you know, when when Tammy was was when Garth went to to find Tammy and they heard the thud, like, what did that mean? Um, you know, if if Garth thought his mother was dead. Then why didn't he call nine one one right away? Right, like I think, I think the the report, the journalist who who was asking questions did a good job of challenging them. Um, but I I think that for me personally, you know, as someone who's who's sat in front of a lot of psychopaths uh, and a lot of felons, um, there's no question that's that's not too difficult, right? So and true, I'm not being watched by a ton of people. Um, but I think it's really important, um, and, and this would, and, and I know Lauren does this too, it's something we talk about, uh, 
to ask questions that are really uncomfortable um, and to ask questions that really get to the core of, of things and challenge people. And, um, you know, I think there were times when, when that could have been done a little more, um, uh, you know, but, and I guess there's, there's a respect issue too. So uh, I guess we don't want to go too far, but, um, you know, maybe it would have been inappropriate, but like when Emma was getting emotional, could the reporter have said, you know, what are you, what's your experience now? What are you thinking about? What are you feeling? Like, in, again, that's probably more of like a, a clinical type question, but um, but I, I think there were definitely questions that, that could have been a little more, you know, challenging uh, and could have gone a little deeper and, um, but it would have been tricky. I think the I think the reporter did a good job, but um, but yeah, I guess if I was there, I think I probably would have been a little harder on them. Yes. Uh, someone said they wondered if Chad was slowly testing the waters to introduce polygamy. That's kind of a little bit off topic, but I want to say absolutely. He married, pretended he pretended to marry Lori Vallow in the temple while both of their spouses were alive. They believed that they were sealed by Moroni and there, you know, what's interesting is on uh, Tammy Daybell's grave marker. It does not mention Chad Daybell's name at all or that they're sealed together forever. It is very, very common in LDS culture to have both spouses on the gravestone, whether one is still alive or not and say that they are sealed together forever. And he did not do that. And uh, then we've, I've had multiple interviews on this YouTube channel with people sharing about exploring other spouses. And Julie Rowe said to Nancy Grace that Chad had said that Julie was a past wife, as was Melanie Gibb. That's on Nancy Grace. I just revisited that this week. And um, so, yes, to that, they were in, in an odd way exploring uh, polygamy, whether earthly and mortal, it was, yeah, definitely. So, um, what would you, I, I was interested in what you were saying and thank you everyone. Everyone's saying you did a great job, babe, while I was gone. <laughs> the, you know, this is, this is the only downside of having your spouse be your co-host. It's such a great idea. And it's such a fun idea to have your spouse be your ghost, but there's all these little, uh, issues that you run into and so I, I do like the idea of if we can bring some listeners on and you know get them to ask questions live that would be that would be really fun yeah yeah and, and more um, personable right more personal we could see them and talk to them that would be that would be we need to try to figure that out yes we do I would like to know, I heard you saying what kind of questions you would at, like them to ask. And I didn't hear obviously everything that you said, but one of the most interesting quotes to me in that whole interview came from Emma Daybell when she said, um, and I'm paraphrasing here because I don't have the exact quote in front of me, but I, it feels like I'm broken and it can't be fixed. I think is very close to what the quote right. is. Did you bring that up while I was gone? No, I didn't. Um, uh, yeah, that would have been an interesting place. I think there were so many places to dig a little deeper. You know, the Garth talking about the raccoon, you know, kind of these, these areas where, um, these areas that really were out of touch with reality, right? Like, so Emma's saying that she felt broken and it'll never be fixed. That was interesting to me because, um, I mean, number one, it was a little self-absorbed, right? Like, why isn't she talking more about the victims, right? And the victims' families. The victims' families are broken. You know, I, I get that she's broken. She lost her mother and her father is in, in, in jail, you know, awaiting murder trial. Um, so I, I get that she feels broken. In some ways, her family is broken. But what she's not really addressing is the grief, you know, broken is more of a kind of an intellectual assessment. It's not an emotional assessment. When she said that, my first thought was she's avoiding any sorrow. She's avoiding any grief. She's just not willing to deal with her emotions here, right? What, you should, what, I, would have, what I was expecting her to say was, I feel really, really sad that all of this is happening. 
you know, I feel really, really sad that the victim, that uh, for the victims, I feel really, really sad for the victims' families. You know, I feel really, really sad that my mother is not here anymore. We don't have a family because my mother is gone. At least if the mother was around, they'd have more of a family, right? So th there's so much grief involved in this. And, you know, with Kay and Larry on, they can speak to that. Like, there's so much loss and so much grief. And that, I think that's one of the reasons why people around the world are really um, tuning into this story and it's resonating with them because it's so bizarre and because it's so sad. And um, it's, you know, it's just an unusual, I think people want to, to deal with all those issues. And I don't think that the Daybell kids really did. So the broken thing was, was really, yeah, it was interesting. I, I think I would have challenged her on that. What do you mean by broken? Yeah, what is broken? Yeah, yeah and I, and I want to say, you know, she's right. It can't be fixed. Whatever they're feeling can't be. And, and the only way they're going to be able to move forward is to address what broken means and then start moving forward. In, in response to what you said about them not discussing the grief of others, to this day, they have not talked to Kay and Larry Woodcock, the kids. And Kay and Larry Woodcock, as I think most everyone knows, have talked to a lot of people. They're here on the chat tonight talking to all of you. Yeah. They're not shy people. Right. I'm sure that they would. And they, they, they care deeply about this case and they've been deeply affected by it. And, and I, I don't know that, you know, I, don't, I, can't, I would not be able to say the same thing about the Dable kids, right? right. I, they care deeply about their dad, but I don't think they've been deeply affected by this case. No, and, you know, that they want the case to go to, away. That kind of goes back to my thing about, um, you know, do, do we let the world change us or do we try to change the world, right? And so like grief, part of grief is accepting loss and it's accepting the fact that, that maybe their mother was killed by their dad. Like it's, 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 it's being able to take in that information that the world is giving us rather than trying to say, well, um, you know, yeah, no, I don't think she was murdered. I think my dad was framed. In other words, they're trying to change the narrative rather than to deal with the evidence and the facts that are out there. Thank you. Karen, thank you for your donation. Is there any meaning to the fact that the kids all emoted the most when talking about the grave being disturbed, which is true. They all agree that that was like the most heartbreaking thing for them was discovering their mother's grave had been disturbed. And it was even more upsetting than when talking about Tammy's death or looking at family pictures. I'm also going to add to that when they discovered human remains in their backyard of, of two innocent children. You know, I, I added that poetic piece at the end of there. But is, is there any meaning to that? That's something you and I have not discussed before. But I, I did notice that when I watch the interview that they all agreed they all looked around yeah the worst day almost of our lives was learning that our our mother's grave had been uh disturbed and she had been taken from there you know <laughs> um and, and not that she was murdered um, not that she had, or died or or right. again the human remains or their dad's well, arrest. I, I think it. I think it speaks to um, some sense of violation, you know, and also, and also, it, it's it's disrupting their their um, kind of their fictional narrative that their father's fine and didn't do anything wrong, right? So when they exhume their mother, they that that's serious. They mean business, right? They're gonna they're gonna look and see what really happened. So I think whatever this this fantasy land, you know. Disneyland like narrative they had about the perfect family. I mean, it should have been disrupted when when Tammy died and Garth went into the bedroom, right? To you know, and he saw his mother dead in his father's arms, but but it wasn't. So um, so I think that they they fence they a couple of things. I think that they there was a sense of violation um, by doing that to their mother. And also it's it's now changing the story to it's going from she died of natural causes to she may have been murdered. Right, so it was the moment where everything changed. Everything changed, right? It's the moment that they can no longer cling to this simplistic view of the world. 
Um, right. Everything changed at that moment. And also there might, be, there might be another minor thing in there about, you know, that we know that their father had this thing about disgust. We've talked about disgust sensitivity um, in our podcast a few times, you know, there, that could be part of the family culture that, you know, they, they see that as a real, um, you know, a real violation of, of somebody who should be resting in her grave. Right. Yeah, no, it, it actually is interesting that they, yeah, to peacefully, to disrupt someone peacefully resting was. Yeah, they see upsetting. that. As, I think it's like a moral, becomes a moral issue, right? It's like a moral violation of, of kind of the universe. Like it's disrupting the code of the universe, which is this yeah. she's dad, she's dad, let her rest in peace. Thank you. That's a great explanation. That helps me understand it a little bit more. Um, Two great questions from Julie and Karen. Um, Julie asks, Julie Holden, or Maude, does John have a take on Garth? And this is great. Yeah, this is a great, we, we haven't addressed this either, but I know we've, uh, he's, Garth is explaining, you know, the thump and uh, what happened after the thump. And he went out there and he says, and this is in quotes. And when it comes from Julie Holden in quotes, you know, it's quotes. She does her research, she's saying, this is what Garth said. My dad was pacing back and forth saying, why? How could this happen? Pointing at pictures on the wall saying, she can't be dead. How could this be? What do we do? Do you have a take on that? Because like Julie, when I heard that, I thought that's what you guys did when you learned your wife and mother was dead. That's what happened next. I think it's it's a version of Chad's response to the to learning about the bodies, right? It's 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 a version of him saying to Emma, "Do you know why they arrested me?" Right? I think there's a little bit of manipulation going on there. His his son basically catches him in the act of doing something, you know, nefarious, whatever, you know. I I think she was dead by then, obviously, but his dad is basically holding you know, his mother's dead body. I mean, that doesn't look good, right? Like that's not, right. she's, not in, she's not in bed. She's half in bed, she's half on the floor. Like whatever's going on there is a little questionable. So I think that Chad's response is, is kind of similar. It's, it's a little bit of a manipulation. I, I don't think there's nothing authentic to it, right? He's not, he's not expressing any real emotion there. He's just, I think he's playing the guard. He's trying to get Garth to think that he's distraught. I know, and I think that's what's shocking too, because if anybody was doing, okay, I mean, maybe, I mean, maybe I'm going to use hindsight bias a little bit too, like, or think that I would be better off. But if someone was acting like that, finding someone dead, the first thing I would think was, okay, so how are you involved? <laughs> because it's so strange to me, so strange. Um, there is something I missed that I, I want to bring up. It's going back a bit, but we were talking about how the Woodcocks have not talked to the Daybell children. And again, I'm saying they're all, they're here talking to us. These are welcoming, wonderful people who are willing to talk to anyone. And Larry, Larry just wrote, I always want to speak to anyone or all of Chad's children. I am here in peace, as I said, when the kids were on earth. We do not think they are culpable in this. Right. Um, I'm asking this question for me. This is so, the, that's just a comment from Larry, but this is a question for me. Um, why have the Daybell children not reached out to the Woodcocks or to anyone that's been deeply affected in this case, let's Colby, you know, Annie, whoever, you know. I think this is taking, this is going to take us back to where we started. This is going to take us full circle because they're so unmatched. Because this is a family culture that is really, uh, has closed ranks to the world. They want to, um, they want to adhere to their narrative and their fiction about what happened here. In fact, in fact, they want to add to it by claiming now that their father was framed, their father's now a victim, 
right? Like he's probably the the least, you know, he's probably he, he's probably the, the the you know the person that's been victimized the least in this entire scenario, right? But now he's right. becoming the ultimate victim, right? So I think they just don't want to deal with the reality of this situation. And you know, like Larry's comment there was great because Larry is willing to mend fences no matter what, like Larry understands that he can't change the outcome of this is, you know, JJ and, and Tylee and Tam, none of these people are coming back. Charles, Charles is, you know, sadly they're not coming back. What's done is done. Larry understands that. Larry's trying to grieve. These kids aren't trying to grieve. No, they're not. These kids, in fact, quite the opposite. They're trying to perpetuate a narrative that's false. And by that, let's go back to that quote by Emma. I feel broken and I can't seem to fix it. She's, they're trying to fix it. They're trying to put this all together and avoid what's really happened. Right. They're, they're trying to avoid the, you know, the reality of the situation. They're, so, right. So they, they apparently think that if their father was framed and he gets acquitted, that at least they can put one of the pieces back. Right. So I think to do what you're suggesting, to reach out to Larry and Kay and, any in Colby and any other of the victims in this case would, would require a level of mental health that they don't have. And it would require a level of grieving that they haven't started. Right. It would require a lot of things that are just not happening for them right now. Okay. I have a big question for you then. I just, I'm going to ask a straightforward question, but first, thank you, Hazel Nutt for your donation and Janelle Little Bear just asked a great question that we're going to bring up too. Uh, Janelle is the wife of Sean Little Bear, who I've interviewed. Mm -hmm. uh, first, in response to that, we, you have empathy for the Daybell children, as do I, as do the Woodcocks. Um, but people get frustrated with them too, rightfully so. I do. I get frustrated with them. They're, I have empathy understanding why they would be in denial. But is there level of denial more extreme than typical. I know that you see people um, try to deny when their family members have done something horrible. Is their level of denial normal or is it extreme? I think to have all five family members more or less on the same page with some slight differences is pretty extreme. I would have expected at least a couple of the family members to question things more, you know, to, to worry about their mother more and whether she was murdered by their father. Like for five siblings to stick together at this level, at this level of denial, um, is, it's pretty extreme. So it shows that there's no independence among these kids. It shows that these kids are so enmeshed that you know they can't separate one from the other. And uh, somebody wrote us too on, on Patreon about, uh, I forget who it was, otherwise I would say it, but um, how these kids have never like lived more than a hundred yards apart from each other. They're basically all living in the same house or they were at the time of Chad's arrest. Um, Even though they're all married and have children. Yeah, they, they all live next to each other. They've never really lived apart. Um, you know, that's another example, right? Like five siblings, you'd expect some of them to, to maybe move away for jobs or school or whatever. Like, you know, typically you're going to get some, um, some independence, right? You're going to get, you're going to get some movement away from the family just to, to, to go out and, and spread your wings and be your own entity. But, uh, but that's not happening here. These kids are, I think they're so enmeshed that they can't even like live you know, more than a hundred yards away from each other. So, um, and yeah, and you know, let me say too, yeah, I have, I do have a lot of empathy for these kids. I think this is like everything in this case, it's a horrible tragedy. And um, I think they're victims, you know, unless somebody can prove otherwise and somebody can show me that Emma was plotting with Chad, then I might change my mind. But right now, based on the evidence, you know, it seems pretty clear that these, these kids were all victims in many ways. And so, yeah, I have a lot of compassion for them. And I, I think it's horrible what they're going through, you know? So, um, 
you know, on the other hand, you know, it's it's like sitting in front of a criminal that's clearly committed a crime. There's so much evidence and the criminal will say, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. You know, I, I didn't, I would never do that. Um, well, you know, your fingerprints are all over the crime. Um, yeah. Right. There's, there's something that's a little maddening or frustrating about it in the sense that there's, there's all this evidence and all this indication that that certain events transpired. And I, I guess obviously we have to go to trial to prove that, but, um, but I would, I would have expected a little more um, independence or a little more movement by now. So I get people's frustration, but yeah, the kids are, are still victims in many ways. Right. We're getting a lot of specifics with where all the kids are living and they're married. Mark is not married and he doesn't have kids. Garth just got married. So I don't believe they have kids yet. Someone mentioned Leah Murphy actually lives in Utah, which is interesting to me because she actually, I have hope in her maybe coming to some truth. I don't know why, but I sense that in watching her and her tears were very real. Um, a couple of questions. We're getting so many great questions. Go ahead, John. Yeah, no, yeah, let me clarify. So I, I think the person that wrote that said that they, like, it may have been recently that Leah moved out, but I think the person that wrote said that it, like, for, you know, for 95% of these kids' lives, they've all lived near each other and with 100 yards of each other. So yeah, that might have changed recently, but it was still kind right. of an astonishing, it was a little bit of an astonishing fact, right? That, that they've essentially lived either in the same house or within 100 yards of each other until very recently. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Hazelnut and Sean, or and Janelle Little Bear, and... Um, so Hazelnut's question, at first I thought it was a comment, but she actually asked a question in there. Um, so she said, these kids do not want to be defined by what their dad has done with a question mark. They are insecure and weak and they can't see themselves as separate from their father with a question mark. And then she wrote, these are really questions with a smiley face and, and a generous donation she sent as well. So kind of looking for clarification. Yeah, I don't know if I'd say they're insecure and weak. Um, I don't know if that's, that's probably not the language I would use. I think um, in enmeshed families, I think that sometimes kids in enmeshed families lack confidence because they really don't, they don't have a clear sense of who they are. You know, when you're really enmeshed with other siblings, you really, the family becomes more important than your individual identity, right? So when that happens, you don't really know who you are. You haven't really worked to figure out who you are because the family is defining most of that. So I think those kids tend to be maybe a little more insecure and they lack some confidence because of that. But, um, you know, that doesn't mean they're weak. I think that it's just, it, you know, we're, we're all a product of our environment to some degree. And it's not hard to imagine if these kids grew up in a healthier family, they'd be completely different, right? So the culture has kind of defined them and that's not their fault. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, Janelle Little Bear, the children said they were the ones who wanted their mother buried without an autopsy. But don't you think they were trying to get to, were they trying to take the blame for their dad so he can appear more innocent? Do you really think, yeah, I mean, I actually have her same question. I, I don't think that they did decide to yeah, not give they, her an autopsy. I think that's hindsight bias. I think that maybe they've convinced themselves it was their decision. I don't think it was their decision. Yeah, I, I think that, um, that that's what they said. They said that their dad looked at them and said, hey, do you guys want to do an autopsy? I mean, first of all, that was kind of bizarre, but uh, I, don't, I don't believe that that was the case. I think Chad's nonverbals or there were, there was way more going on in that room than, than they're letting on. So, um, and also, like, what, what child in that moment of absolute shock and grief and disbelief is going to say, oh, yeah, let's do an autopsy of my mom, right? Like, there, nobody's going to do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe, maybe if a child had some real suspicions and thought their dad was guilty right away, maybe they would do that. But at that point, it's super unlikely that they would, they would go to that, right? Because, I mean, an autopsy is, is disruptive and... You know, nobody nobody necessarily wants to do an autopsy on their their mother. So 
you know, again, but autopsy I mean, implies a mystery too, yeah. right? It means something right. you don't want to know. Right, exactly. It means that, right. So I think one of the kids would have would have had to at that point have some suspicions about their dad, and that certainly wasn't the case. So if Chad did do that, he knew the kids were going to go along with it. You know, right. And I think that there's something in this family that looks well. Not I think I know they they filter everything through God and their religion. They kind of showed that on the interview when uh, Emma said, my dad wouldn't do that because he knows that God thinks it's bad for him to kill. That was me paraphrasing, but everything was filtered through God and religion. And so if, if their mother died, they would want it to just be her time and meant to be, and they're not gonna wanna look to the science of it for an answer. Um, and then in addition to that, I think there's a big distrust to people outside their family. I, I talk, mm -hmm. I've talked about that, and which is a part of a cult too. Not only is a cult trusting the leader, it's distrusting anyone that isn't the leader. And they have a big distrust in police. They mentioned that. Police aren't telling us the truth about this case. Um, if my mother was found dead, I wouldn't start looking at pictures in a hallway. I'd call 911. And they didn't. I think there's a distrust in authority outside of their little family and right. so I think that an autopsy is an outsider you know it's science-based it's an outs it's outside of their realm of security so my right. thoughts it's the, it's the state or the county intruding upon their their lives yeah anyway uh we told our babysitter we'd be an hour and it's been an hour and hour and a half but babe i want you to know 1500 people are watching tonight it's the most we have ever had on a live before um we're so grateful that both larry and Kay have been here with us tonight and and shared their thoughts I, we know larry is often um just with Kay and not as vocal and, and i think that um i so appreciate what they said and i i truly do hope that the daybell children will reach out to the Woodcocks at one point. And if they do that, I think there's a lot of hope, you know, that maybe they'll, but right now it looks, it's, it's hard. It looks, it looks bad as far as them being able to come to reality. Um, thank you to our mods tonight. Um, they have been so wonderful posting links about our podcasts and about our Patreon and what we do. If anyone missed those, they are in, going to be in the description of this YouTube video. The mods, please feel free, moderators, to post your Facebook groups or anything that you feel is important. I want to share the love. And then I am just amazed at the amount of donations we've had today from so many generous people. This is the first night I haven't been able to address every uh, person's question that donated, and I'm sorry about that, or comments. And I just wanna say though, that we are so very grateful. Yeah, thank you all. We really appreciate it. The moderators are amazing. Thank you guys. Thank you to our listeners. You know, obviously we couldn't do this without you guys. Um, like I tell Lauren all the time, you know, I, when we started this whole process, uh, last July, I said, you know, if, if, if we have one person who listens to this, it's probably going to be my mother. Then, um, you know, she we'll does listen. She <laughs> does. Yeah. She listens. She's a big fan. Mine doesn't. Her. Yours does. <laughs> yeah, that's <true. laughs> um, but, but obviously um, I tell Lauren that, you know, I'm really humbled um, by every, by all of the attention we've gotten and all the great feedback more than anything. And especially um, grateful to people that um, have listened to our podcast and watched our YouTube and have reflected on their own lives and their own families and written us uh, and thanked us for kind of uh, helping them. And that, that was something that we had hoped for, but um, we're very grateful that, that that has happened to some degree. So, um, so we really, really are humbled and appreciative of all of you guys and all your support. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. And again, that little thing we mentioned about getting a recording of Chad Daybell, um, the day that supposedly he met Lori um, Daybell, we, we will figure out a way to release that soon. And then people asking about Lori Hellis, 
Um, Lori says hello, and we will um, have her back very soon because we need her to answer all our legal questions. A couple legal questions did come in, and I thought we'll wait for the good Lori to be back with us to answer those. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, mods. Thank you, uh, supporters and donators. And um, Dr. John and I have an announcement. We just don't have a date, but feel free to leave, leave this in comments for us if you have an opinion. We are going to start the Hidden Hour this September. We're going to leave TGIFs to Lori Hellis and some different guests I have here and there. And Dr. John and I want to do something called the Hidden Hour every week, where the two of us talk and we get that babysitter booked for two hours, not just one. <laughs> and we want to know the best day of the week for that. We were going to do Saturday. And then right when we said Saturday, someone said, well, that's football night. And we thought, well, maybe that's not the best night. Um, so our initial plan was Saturday. If that's still a day everyone likes, let us know if there's a better day. Um, leave it in the comments because we, we hoped to announce the day we were going to do it. But uh, we definitely are still working out those little details. And but. we we were going to start tomorrow, but we're doing this instead. So, um, but we're looking at probably Wednesday, right? Wednesday night, Thursday night, or Saturday night. Those are probably our best options at the moment. So let us know um, which of those nights would work the best or that would be the most accessible to you guys. And, and Wednesday, we'll Thursday, or Saturday. Wednesday, yeah. Thursday, or Saturday. Yeah, and then we'll leave Friday for your TGIF. Yeah, Thank and you. thank you to Audrey Jensen for your donation as well. And and thank you to, uh, yeah, generous donators tonight. Thank you. So many, some repeat donators too. Thank you, thank you.